just in awe of all these, these powerful women around you. We're all going through things and we're able to share that. And in that sharing, you almost, um, you don't feel alone and that's a powerful thing. I don't know about you, that just makes me want to dance, right? I won't do it to save myself the embarrassment, but I am robbing you of enjoyment. Um, but Women's Conference Woco One Day is coming up. And again, if you are a lady or know a woman, and this is an incredible event to invite them to, um, I attend every year, even though I'm not a woman, because it's amazing. One, because the smart support my wife and the women of our church. But, but two, it's just always an incredible event and hearing the truths. Uh, we've even had a man get saved at WOCO before. And so it's an amazing event. Make sure you get your tickets if you haven't already. But also we are finishing up this series we've been in now. This is week five of Sacred Stewardship. So I'm excited to kind of wrap this up and, and really try to to help you not only understand this one last time, but give you a process of how to be a faithful steward. But as always, before we jump into the text, why don't you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather. And I know this weekend, God's Labor Day weekend, there's a lot of people traveling or out and watching online. So thank you for the opportunity we have to gather online as well. Because we know, God, something, something supernatural happens when we gather together, when the people of God are together and the presence of God is here and as we're looking at the word of God. And so God, we pray today that as we do this, that you would help us. Help us to see the truth that are in these words. And then God, by your spirit, through grace, help us to live out these words. God, we really do want to be found faithful as stewards, God. And so God, we pray that you would help us to do that. And as always, God, help me to communicate this word in a way that honors you and is helpful to us. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. We've been having this conversation, like I said, over the last several weeks of this series entitled Sacred Stewardship. And the reason why we called it Sacred Stewardship is to help you kind of understand this isn't just a stewardship. You're not just responsible for something. This is sacred because God has entrusted you and me with something. And so our tagline has been, I've got it here on the screen, the sacred stewardship is caring for what God entrusted to us. And that's what makes it sacred. God has entrusted something to us. First and foremost, he's entrusted us with our own breath, our own soul. We are the only thing that is created in the image of God in this entire universe. And so if you look around, you're looking at little, literally little images of God. You are seeing, and we're going to get to this in Ephesians, and I'm going to love to talk about it there too, but God's handiwork. And so God has entrusted to us our own souls. But not only that, because we sinned and mess everything up, and then God sent his son Jesus, we're also stewarding the salvation of our souls. Not only he created us, but he recreated us. He saved us in Christ. So we're stewarding not just the breath he's given us, but we're stewarding now the salvation, the forgiveness he's given us. And so that's what makes this whole thing sacred. And we've been talking about this primarily out of one key text in Acts chapter 20. If you want to, you can turn there. We're gonna be in Acts 20 today. I'm gonna read this same verse. Then we're also gonna go to 1 Corinthians 4 and then 2 Corinthians 6 because I wanna kind of bring this home and show you how to be a faithful steward. But again, the key text that we've been looking at is Acts 20, verse 28, which I think really describes everything that I've just said. Paul said in Ephesians, that's next week, all right? Acts 20, 28, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. So that's the stewardship part. We are to pay careful attention to ourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Think of that word as stewards. To care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So again, you see 
God has entrusted something to us that he obtained with his own blood, which is us if we're saved and the people of God. So God has given us this stewardship and therefore he wants us to pay careful attention. Again, if you haven't been here for the last several weeks, you can go listen to those messages. But what I wanna do this week is we're gonna wrap this whole thing up and I want to help you. I'm gonna try to simplify this as, as simple as I can make it, all right? Kind of boil this down to the basic ingredients. If we're going to be good stewards, here's what it takes. But it comes out of this concept in 1 Corinthians chapter four. So again, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. If not, I've got it here on the screen. But 1 Corinthians chapter four, verse one and two, same guy, the apostle Paul, just talking to a different church now, or the same church in a different location because it's all one church. But listen to what Paul says here. You're gonna see stewardship. He says, this is how one should regard us. He's talking about himself, the pastors, the leaders, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. So there's our word, as stewards of the mysteries of God. Verse two, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found what? Faithful. If you're new, I'd like for you to call and respond. Let's try that again, especially in Jasper and online as well, okay? It is required of students they be found what? Faithful. faithful. They be found faithful. So the title of this week's message is Found Faithful. And again, what I want us to do is I want us to have kind of like a process of thinking. Like, okay, how can I be found faithful? Well, the first thing that we see here in this text is how Paul even refers to this concept of stewardship and servant when he says, this is how we want you to regard us. Now, the word regard there means to have an opinion about, how we want you to think about. So again, Paul is telling the church at Corinth how he wants them to think about him, how he wants them to think about the apostles, the elders, the leaders. He's saying, we want you to think about, regard us as servants and stewards. Servants and stewards. So here's what I want you to think. That's how Paul saw himself. That's how Paul saw himself. He saw himself as a servant of Christ and as a steward of the mysteries of God. Now let's talk about those two words. I love it because they both start with S, all right? So it's easy to remember. But this is where it starts. It starts with us regarding ourselves this way, thinking about ourselves in this way. The first one he says is, I want you to think about us, regard us as a servant. Now this one primarily relates to how we are to relate to one another. We are to relate to one another as a servant. Now, many years ago, I think now almost 10 years ago, we did a series here based upon the teaching of Jesus where he talked in the gospels about how leaders are to be. He was telling his own disciples and he said, you've heard it that the leaders of the Gentiles, they lord it over them. But he says, not so with you. And then he gives arguably the greatest leadership lesson ever given when he says, if you wanna be great, you are to be a servant. And we did a series then, and a lot of you probably weren't even here, based upon this idea of servant, because here's how I thought, and again, sometimes I'm clever, but the word servant ends with the same three letters as the word tyrant. It's the word ant. So we did this series called, Which Ant Are You? Are you a servant? Are you a tyrant? All right? See what I did there? It's kind of cute, all right? But the concept of it was, when it comes to how you live your life, you're either one or the other. Because a tyrant comes over the top. Jesus said they lord it over. So it's the idea of coming over. Like you treat yourself like you're better. But a servant, watch this, comes from under. A servant says, no, I'm not here to lord it over. I'm here to lift up. And here's what Paul says. He says, I want you to think of us as a servant. Where did Paul get this idea of leadership from? From Jesus. You know, that's the right answer in church always. From Jesus, Jesus saw himself as a servant. He said in Mark, the son of man didn't come to be served, but to be a servant. So Paul says, this is how I want you to think about us. I want you to think about us as a servant. Now here's the key. 
I want you to see how he connects these two. He says, also a steward. So think about it like this. Stewardship is not about our relationship with one another. It's about our relationship with God. Servant, I told you, is about our relationship with one another. Stewardship is about our relationship with God. So here's how it's connected. If you're going to be a good steward of God, you must be a servant to others. See, your stewardship is only as great as your servanthood. Let me say it like this. If you're running your life like you're a tyrant, you're a bad steward. But if you're running your life like you're a servant, you're there to serve, you're being a good steward. But here's what we need to see. Everything in our culture today, everything, the air we breathe in our culture, every message we get communicated to our culture is the exact opposite of that. In our world today, we don't wanna be servants, we wanna be celebrities. We wanna be celebrities. Sadly, a lot of the goal of young people today is I want to be famous. Because here's what we've told people. No, you don't want to be servants. You want to have servants, right? Like the good life is you sitting on a beach and someone else bringing you my ties. That's the good life. And some of y'all might be doing that right now, watching from the beach, all right? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that necessarily, but what I'm saying is if you live your life thinking you're trying to get to the level of achievement where you have servants instead of you are a servant, then you're a bad steward. And everything in our culture is going to push you in the opposite direction of being found faithful as a steward of God by living your life as a servant. We wanna be celebrities, not servants. And this is what I need us to see. We live in such this individualized, narcissistic culture that it's all about us. And that's a direct attack on how we should regard ourselves. Because here's what I've realized. People will say, I want to be a servant, but watch this. But when someone starts treating them like a servant, like, oh no, think about it. Oh, I want to be a servant. Okay, serve me. Who are you? <laughs> Think about it like this. You can sit up there on your wedding day and make all these beautiful vows that you'll put one another ahead of each other. But at 1130 at night, when she asks you to go downstairs and get water, you're like, come on, woman. <laughs> you should be getting me water. I know that's never happened for any of y'all, right? <laughs> See, it's, it's real easy and yes, that has happened in my own life, okay? And this is the beauty of having kids. Hey, your mama wants water. <laughs> she ain't my wife, I know, but you my kid, right? I'm just teaching you how to be like Jesus. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? All of us love the idea of being a servant until someone actually treats us like one. I mean, just think about it. You want to be treated like a servant? Someone who says, I am here to serve you. I am here to disregard myself to benefit you. That doesn't sound like the good life, does it? But it's directly, watch this, it's directly connected to how you see yourself. How do you regard yourself? Jesus said it like this. If your Lord served, I've given you an example to do the same thing. Here's what's crazy to me. So often we are not willing to do the very thing our God did. And was there a more faithful steward than Jesus himself? No. No. And what I want you to see is in order for us to be servants who are good stewards, watch this, he says, it's required that stewards be found faithful. If we're going to be good stewards, if we're gonna be found faithful, then we must regard ourselves, see ourselves, have the opinion about ourselves where we see ourselves as a servant. And that's why it is so important 
for us, again, as we wrap this idea up around stewardship, to know, okay, how do I do that? How do I do that? Now, as I was thinking about this, in fact, I've been kind of working on this all for months and months now, for, for the whole summer during my sabbatical, really thinking about the process of transformation in my own life, like trying to make sure that I am transformed into the image of Christ that we talked about last week in Galatians chapter four. Paul said, I'm in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Like, I want that. I want Christ to be formed in me. And I've said this to you many times if you've been around here, I'm just a simple guy. And that's one of the reasons why I love math. Now that may seem like a weird sequitur to you, but I want you to understand something. The reason why I like math is because two plus two equals four. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. Which we live in a weird culture today. Like, no, actually, what do you mean by two? Whatever, okay. I mean, one, two. Two more of them is four, right? I mean, it's simple. And I've had to learn, especially as I'm going through my doctorate, because if you've ever done that, in my doctorate, we don't take tests, which to you may sound awesome, but it means you have to write a lot of papers. And when you have to write a lot of papers, you have to express your emotions, which typically I didn't like writing papers because I don't like expressing my emotions. I'm like, two plus two equals four. Can I just have that? But I'm learning, I'm growing, all right? But here's where I'm going with all this math stuff. As I was thinking about this, I'm like, okay, how can we be found faithful? as stewards. I was like, I know, I'll make a formula. I'll make a formula. And, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you this formula, but here's how I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it in terms of ingredients. Like if you're going to make something or bake something, you gotta have these ingredients. In fact, Natalie, my daughter and I, there's a new crumble cookie here in Canton, which is gonna be my downfall, by the way. Whew. I mean, it was amazing when we would go on vacation, we could get crumbled, but now they moved into my zip code. I mean, I've got to talk to my counselor about this. So Natalie was like, do you want crumble? The answer is yes. So we were in crumble the other day. And I don't know if you've been in there, but they have these huge mixers right at the front of the store. And they were, I don't even know what they were mixing, but all I know is the lady took out this like slab of butter and like unwrapped it and like dumped it. I mean, it was like, she was like, <sighs> you know, like dumping the, the butter in there. And I said, Natalie, look at that butter. I mean, I was, y'all are salivating now? I mean, maybe I should buy stock in the store because I, I should get some kickbacks for this, all right? And I said, Natalie, can you imagine just eating that butter by itself? Like, that doesn't taste good. Just, I mean, butter is one of those things that like it makes everything else better. Maybe that's, we should just call it butter is better, right? Almost any kind of sweet, if you're going to bake something, it better have a, a stick. I mean, I remember my mama making stuff. You like try to, she's like, no, put the stick in there. And it's really good if it took two sticks, right? I mean, I started salivating so much. I asked the lady, I said, hey, do they let y'all lick the bowl? I asked her that straight up. She said, No but I wish they would. I'm like, me too. So do you get free cookies at least? She said, yeah, we get free cookies. I'm like, no, you better apply to this place, right? <laughs> or maybe not. That way I can keep preaching until I'm 60, all right? So. But here's what I started thinking about it. Butter by itself, you may like to eat it by, your, by itself, but typically most people don't like, just give me some butter. You're right. You put it in something. And when you put it in something, you put the ingredients together, then something amazing comes out. That's how I want you to think about this. I want you to think about these four things I'm about to show you as a formula or as ingredients. And if you put these four things together, you will be found faithful. All right, you with me? So here we go. Here's the process of stewardship. Here's the four things. And I'm gonna, I'll say them to you all and then I'll come back and break them down. The presence of God the principles of God, and they all start with a P, and I'm really proud of it, all right? And by principles of God, I mean the word of God. The word principle means truth, all right? So the presence of God, the principles of God, the people of God, and a pattern of practicing truth. 
So those are the four ingredients that it takes to be found faithful. The presence of God, the principles of God, the people of God, and a pattern of practicing truth in your life. Now, let me break these four things down. These four ingredients or four parts are necessary because this is how God set up the world. This is how God set up how we are to be good stewards. You see all four of these in the garden, by the way, before sin ever entered the world. You had God, presence of God. You had his word, what he told them. You had the people, and then they had to go obey it. So you see it all right there. And these four parts, let me just break each one of them down individually because each are necessary. You cannot remove any of them. The first one, the presence of God. When I say the presence of God, I almost put the person of God, but he's one God, three persons. So then I almost put the persons of God, but then you're like, what in the world is that? So I put presence, but I want you to understand something. When I talk about the presence of God, I'm talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all three persons, because all three, one God, three persons are active in this process. So you have God, the Father, you have God, the Son, you have God, the Holy Spirit. And depending upon your church tradition, you might emphasize one over the other. And I'm not here to get into that conversation, but here's what I'm saying. All three are necessary. And here's why that is important. You and I, this is what's crazy about God. You and I cannot be a faithful steward of God without God. Let me say it like this. You can't obey God without God. And here's the good news. He's not asking you to. This was like a revolutionary thought to me. I'll never forget. I, I mean, I'd been following Jesus for over 10 years. I know because it was in my mid to late 20s. And that's how you know you're old, because you refer to decades now, all right? Like you start out with months, then you go to years, then you go to decades. So I remember thinking that the person of God, and primarily through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because see, I grew up in a tradition that was like, no, 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 no. We kind of reject the Holy Spirit because all we ever thought about when it came to the Holy Spirit was the gifts of the Spirit. So it was like, we don't want those funky things, so we're staying away from him. We cool with Jesus, Holy Spirit, what's a weirdo? But here's what we fail to realize. A, we fail to realize the Holy Spirit gives gifts. He does not give the same gifts to everybody. But it's also the fruit of the what? Spirit. Notice Paul says in Galatians 5, fruit of the Spirit. Then he gives this long list of eight things that are character qualities, love, patience, speech, kindness, all that. That's not a fruit of you. Notice he doesn't call that the fruit of your flesh. Here's what I'm saying. You can't get those qualities without the Spirit because it's the fruit or the result of the Spirit. So instead of saying, God, make me more patient, because you've prayed that before, right? And he puts you in a situation to show you that you're not patient. No, what you say is, God, fill me with your Spirit. It's what I pray before I preach every time. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying, empower me. Help me. And then the more I'm filled with the spirit, watch this, the more I get the fruit of the spirit. So here's the cool thing about God. And, this, and I say this all the time, and I'll keep saying this all the time because you'll never understand it unless I do it. You can't obey God without God. And the good thing is he's not asking you to. God built this system for you to need him. And this is where Christianity is utterly different than any other religion. See, every other religion has what they call the word of God, their Bible, their Quran, their Book of Mormon. They have their texts, their sacred texts. They have their people. And they have patterns that you should obey. The difference is the presence of God. See, all those other religions, 
try to get you to do those things so that you can get to God's presence. But Christianity says, no, you could have never done those to get to those God's presence. So God came to you. God became flesh and dwelt among you so that his spirit could dwell in you. God is not just out there. He is in here empowering us. So you need the presence of God. So watch this. You cannot be, I cannot be a faithful steward of God without God. And the good news is God never gets tired of you asking him. He's a good father. So every day in every circumstance that you ever walk into, God is never going to get tired of you and I asking the question, God, can you help me? Because here's what's cool. When you get help, he gets glory. Did you ever think about that? It glorifies God to help you. So you could be robbing God of glory thinking that you can do it without God. But that's like a cookie with no butter. You're like, what was the message today? It was about cookies. It's one of the greatest messages I've ever heard. Second one, principles of God. Second ingredient. The word of God. Not only do you need the presence of God, but you need the principles of God. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Then the word became flesh and dwelt among us in John 1. We did that in that series. So the word of God, listen. The word of God says about itself, it's powerful and active. Sharper than a double-edged sword. Isaiah says it goes forth and produces what God wants. Think about this. God spoke the world into existence. So in the power of his word comes the world. So you and I, not only do we need the presence of God, we need the word of God. We need the principles of God. And I'll show you more why in just a second. Third one, we need the people of God. And just to be honest to you, when I was putting this principle, this uh, kind of process together over the summer, I only had three ingredients. I had the presence of God, principles of God, and the fourth one, pra- the pattern of practicing truth. And as I went through my sabbatical, and I've said this before over the last several weeks, and if you listen to our podcast, I talked about it there. One of the biggest revelations I think God showed me was I need people. People is God's plan A. And here's where I think a lot of times we get wrong. And I think we get wrong even in thinking about the idea of being a servant because God calls us to be a servant. Well, watch this. If God called you to serve other people, doesn't it stand to reason that God called other people to serve you? Being a servant goes both ways which means I'm here to serve you, but I also understand I need you to serve me. Now, again, I'm not saying serve me in the you know, tyrant kind of way, but what I'm saying is God built it so that you need people. And the script that I used to tell myself was I don't need you. I mean, I was even gonna build the ingredients list to come tell you. And God's like, hold up, sucker, you're wrong. So I put in people of God. Here's what I'm saying to you just you and Jesus and a Bible is not enough. Like, how dare you say that about God? I'm not saying anything about God. I'm just telling you what God himself said. Because even in the beginning of Genesis 1 and 2, when God created man, and man was here on earth with God and his word, God said, this isn't good. It's not good for man to be alone. So contrary to popular belief, dog is not man or woman's best friend. They're awesome, one of his best creations, but not best friend. Why? Because they don't talk back to you, which is one of the reasons why you love them so much. But they'll never help you grow. You need flesh and blood people, other image bearers of God to help you. So that's part of the process. And here's what I want you to see. If you ever want to have a pattern, the fourth one, a pattern of practicing truth. It's gonna take God, his word, and his people to give you that fourth one. 
a pattern of practicing the truth. So watch this. If there is not a pattern of practicing truth in your life in some area, it's a failure of the other three. You're not asking God for help. You're making up your own words. Or you're not connecting with his people. You need all of these ingredients. You say, where do you get this? I'm glad you asked. Look at Acts 20, verse 32. This is the verse we did several weeks ago. Well, I'm gonna bring it up and then we're gonna go to 2 Corinthians 6. I want you to see all four things in here. Listen to what Paul said. And now I commend you that I entrust you to God, presence of God, and to the word of his grace, principles of God, the word of God, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance. That right there is the practice of pattern truth. Because anybody who's ever built anything knows it doesn't happen overnight. It happens consistently over time. Building up. And then see this, among all, that's the people. Among all those who are sanctified. So you see all four things in this one verse. And I could show you verse after verse after verse after verse throughout the entire Bible where you will see these things. I don't have time to even get into it. It's so pervasive. But I wanna show you this. And here's why. Remember what we're trying to accomplish here. We're trying to accomplish being found faithful. So if we wanna be found faithful as good stewards who live as servants, we're gonna develop this process in our life. We're gonna have these ingredients in our life. The presence of God, the principles of God, the people of God in a pattern of practicing truth. Because here's what I have come to realize, and any psychologist or good coach would tell you, my next point, the power is in the pattern. The power is in the pattern. You've heard the phrase, practice makes perfect. And that's kind of true. But it's not that practice makes perfect. It's perfect practice perfects. Because bad practice don't make nothing perfect. Right? Like Alan Alverson, we're talking about practice, man. But the power is in the practice. The power is in the pattern. So if you and I want to be found faithful, we better have a pattern because that's where the power is. Any, any consultant, any coach, anybody that's gonna tell you if you want to experience change or transformation in your life, it is you need a pattern. And here's the good news. We don't have to wait till January 1st to start it. I'm not saying that's a bad time to start it, I mean, you might get a discount at a gym because they're banking on you only coming for 30 days and then not showing up the rest of the 11 months. But you can start now because the power is in the pattern. But here's the thing. The reason why we don't have a pattern of faithfulness is because we think that the process of stewardship equals just a pattern of practicing truth and we cut out the other ingredients. Let me say it like this. We try to produce the pattern without God, without his word, and without his people. But if the power is in the pattern, don't you think that God also showed you how to get the pattern? He's showing you the process of stewardship. Now flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to show you this again. Speaking of patterns, I want you to hear how Paul talks. Again, most times we just preach through books of the Bible, which we'll start next week going through the book of Ephesians. But sometimes in series like this of messages, I'll pull in other texts to kind of show you the same principle of God's word that's found elsewhere in God's word. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I was thinking about this, A, because I was in 1 Corinthians 4, thinking about this concept of stewardship. And then B, of pattern. And then as I was reading in Corinthians, this kind of struck me because I want you to see how Paul talks about this in terms of a pattern and the thing that disrupts the pattern. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 3. 
Paul says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. So think again, servants. Before I get into the list, hold on a second. Listen to what Paul says here. See, Paul is the apostle and him as the apostle would go to different areas and he would start churches. And then of those churches, he would develop elders or pastors. We believe those are synonymous in the Bible. Shepherds, teachers. And then he would leave just like he did in Ephesus and then he would write letters back. So he did the same thing in Corinth. So the apostle Paul's job, watch this. The apostle Paul's job as a pastor, an apostle, was to teach pastors and leaders to develop a process of making disciples. That was his job. That's my job. It's the process of disciples. And I love how Paul says this. And you may not have caught it. And that's why I want to explain it to you. He said, we put no obstacle in your way. So think about it like this. If there is a path that we should follow, which is why we call it our discipleship pathway. If you were here last week, I talked about it. Gatherings, serving on a team, getting into a group, discipleship groups, which we're developing. So there's kind of this process. Remember I told you stewardship calls you out of secrecy into public responsibility. So there's this process that we go through. That's how Paul's thinking here. He's saying there's a process, there's a pathway. And this is what he says. We put no obstacle in your way. We didn't put an obstacle in the pathway or the process. Why? Because he says, we want to be good stewards. As servants of Christ, we want to be able to commend ourselves in every way. So think about this. My job, our job as pastors and leaders is to not only create the process or not create it, but really show you the process that God created, communicate it. Then it's also our job to make sure there's no obstacles in the way. You tracking with me on that? So it's our job to make sure that we're forming you into the image of Christ and then making sure there's no obstacles, no offenses. I just thought you could also think fences. No, nothing blocking it. Paul says we didn't put it in any way. And then he's going to describe the pattern. And then in verse 11 and 12, he's gonna tell you what the obstacle is. He didn't put it there, but there's one there. But listen to this pattern. He says, and you know this because he uses the word by, which is a preposition of means and saying this is how it happens. So the power's in the pattern. Listen, here's the pattern. You're gonna love it. Great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, Hunger, and you're like, pastor, I ain't loving this. <laughs> Can I just tell you something? I don't know who told you that the pattern would be painless, but they lied to you if they did tell you that. And this is what I want you to see, and I'll, I'll wrap this up in a second. There's a lot of people that they start walking with Jesus Presence of God, principles of God, they're down with it. People of God, this pattern. And somewhere in that pattern, it got hard. They got afflictions. They got hardships, they got calamities. Beatings? I mean, think about that as a marketing tool. Follow Jesus and get beat. I mean, it's a winner. Imprisonments, riots, labors, work, sleepless nights, hunger. Why do you think we do a 21-day fast at the beginning of every year? Let me say it like this. Have you wanted holiness so much that you were willing to go hungry for it? Because that's the role of fasting. The role of fasting is to supercharge your prayer and your abiding in the word because 
your hunger reminds you that there's something you want more. You want to be filled with something more, filled with the Spirit, filled with the Word of God. So your hunger is a way, watch this, that you reset your hunger. You're hungry for holiness. You're hungry for God. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of us aren't growing spiritually because our hunger is satisfied by a burger. And listen, God bless burgers. I don't know if you knew this, but hamburgers were created in Athens, Texas. I'm for them. I hate Athens. We played them in high school. They were one of our rivals, but I love what they came up with. See, here's what I'm saying. So many of us fail to be found faithful because we weren't prepared for the pattern to be painful. We want growth without pain. And that's not how it works. Here's the good news, though. There's a comma after verse five. That ain't the whole list. Look at verse six. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit. I think Paul was like gonna write out the fruits of the Spirit. He's like, I'm just gonna say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, see, that's what I'm talking about. You can't develop the pattern without the presence of God. You need the Holy Spirit. He goes on, look at this, genuine love by truthful speech. <laughs> I love this. And the power of God. See, verse six is horrible. I mean, verse five is horrible. Verse six is awesome. But think about it. He said purity. Think about this. Power in your life is directly connected to the purity of your life. Let me go a step further. The presence of God is directly connected to the purity. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they will, anybody know? See God. Maybe you're not seeing God because you keep seeing things that are not pure. So I used to tell teenagers all the time and they used to think I was lying. What you see now will directly affect the health of your marriage later. See, we no longer live in a culture of purity. What's amazing to me is now even people will dog the Christian culture of the 80s and 90s and call it the purity culture as if there was something wrong with that. See, part of the pattern is living a pattern of purity, pattern of knowledge, pattern of genuine love, of truthful speech. How in the world do we get all that stuff? through the Holy Spirit and the power of God. See, Jesus told the Pharisees in the Gospels, he said, you know what your problem is? You don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. See, all this is part of the process. It's part of the pattern. But that's not all. Look at verse eight and nine and 10. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. Uh, sorry, I mean, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, verse eight, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known. Talk about celebrity and servant right there. As dying and behold, we lived, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. That's the pattern. Now, I want you to see verse 11 and 12. See, Paul said, power's in the pattern, but they weren't restricted by any obstacle he put in. Look at verse 11. He says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. Verse 12, you are not restricted by us. He's saying, we're not the problem for this failure of a pattern in your life. He says, but you are restricted in your own affections. Now, I've said this many times. I can't speak for every pastor, or every church that's ever existed. But I can speak for our church. The goal of Revolution Church, we say this all the time. If you come through our stewardship process, we're committed to two things here. Person of Jesus 
That's what we're talking about this. We love Jesus and the process of growth. We are committed to that. This is Jesus's church, and we're gonna do what Jesus said to do, make disciples. So that's what we're committed to. We're committed to him and, the, and making disciples. Now, the process isn't perfect, but I can make this commitment to you. We will do everything that we can to make sure that there's no obstacle put in your way. But I think a lot of times what happens is Satan is clever and crafty, and here's what he does. He takes out a lot of people in this process because he gets them to blame someone else for their failure to be found faithful. It's like, well, I quit going to church because this person hurt me or this person hurt me. I'm not saying they didn't hurt you, but here's what I'm saying. At the end of the day, you were not restricted by them. The word restricted means to narrow. Think of it like arteries. Like your arteries are there, your heart's pumping blood and it's pumping blood through your arteries all over your body. And when they're open and unrestricted, you feel good. But when they start getting restricted through old age and crumble cookie, right, it starts to get restricted. Here's what Paul's saying. You're not restricted by anything or anyone outside of you. This is not an outside problem. And as long as you keep focusing on the lack of your growth on the outside, Satan won. You're not restricted by anyone outside of you. You're only restricted by what's inside of you. It's interesting Paul uses, he says, you're not restricted by us. You're restricted by your own affections. This word here, affections, it's very interesting. It literally means innards, bowels. Talk about restrictions. What was the message today? It was about cookies and bowels. It was a great message. Literally, this word here, affections, from Greek into English, it's the English word spleen. <laughs> Here's what Paul just said. You're only restricted by your spleen. What, Paul? We're not even sure what the spleen does. Apparently, you can live without it. You know, the church is a body. That's, I always laugh. Some of y'all are like the appendix. We don't know what you do, but you can get infected and, and, and kill us all. <laughs> For real, if you ain't lived in church long enough... And the spleen is like that. You're like, I mean, playing football, you get a lot of spleen injuries. You're like, what? what's the spleen? Now, I'm not a doctor, so all of y'all are, that are doctors, this is not medical advice, but according to Google, all right, <laughs> this is what the spleen does. Now, I want you to listen to this, and I promise you I'm gonna make a spiritual point with this. Your spleen's main function is to act as a filter for your blood. Listen to this. It recognizes and removes old, malformed, and damaged red blood cells. It acts as a filter, filtering. Blood's flowing through it. When blood flows into your spleen, your spleen performs quality control. Your red blood cells must pass through a maze of narrow passages. So think about it like this. You and I are only restricted by our internal filter. And Paul calls that affections. Let me say it to you like this. If you and I are gonna be found faithful, we better have the right filter. In fact, that's my last point. To be stewards that are found faithful, we need the right filter. What do I mean by that? Think of this process of stewardship, presence of God, principles of God, people of God, and a pattern of practicing truth. Think of that as a filter. Think, this was, think of this book as your spiritual spleen. How's that for a picture? 
Here's what I'm saying. If you want to be found faithful, you better have a filter for your affections. Because it's only your affections that have ever led you astray. It's not God. And it's not someone else outside of you. Jeremiah says, your heart is desperately, desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. No one has lied to you more than your own affections. And here's what's crazy. We live in a world today that says, if you feel it, it must be right. Let me explain something to you. Your feelings are real. I'm not saying, and the Bible is not saying, your feelings aren't real. You really feel them. But what the Bible is saying is, God and his word through the process of his people are what decides if it's right not real. Let me ask you a question. How do you filter your affections? Because if you don't filter your affections through the presence of God, the principles of God, and the people of God, you will not be found faithful as a steward of God. You got a messed up filter, man. Let me explain it to you. This is, I mean, it's simple, but it is so relevant. Listen to the word. This is what the word, this is what Google said about the spleen. It filters out old, malformed, and damaged red blood cells. Let me ask you a question. You got anything in you that's old? Let me ask it like this. 2 Corinthians chapter five says, those in Christ are a new creation. So if you're in Christ, you're new. But the Bible says the old you is still there. Your flesh. See, this is where people say, well, my flesh feels that way. Here's what you gotta say to yourself. But that's the old you. That's the old you. Your feelings are now being Dictated, filtered by the old you, not the new you. See, the new you is a new creation in Christ, but you better have a filter that says, that's not the new you. That's the old you. The old you thought that way. The old you saw yourself that way. The old you thought that you were ruled by those feelings, but now you got a new you that better filter out the old. Malformed. Any of you got some malformed feelings. That was rhetorical, but every hand should have just gone up. I don't care if you're driving, you'd be like, yes! How do you filter those? You better have a filter. Because here's what I know. Not only was it an old you, it was a messed up you. It was a malformed you. Damaged you. Listen, I'm not saying you don't have real feelings. I'm not saying you haven't been malformed by others. I'm not saying you haven't been damaged or traumatized. What I'm saying is you better have the presence of God and the principles of God and the word of God. I mean, the people of God. And sometimes the people of God is a licensed professional counselor that's helping you filter those affections. If you ever want to have a pattern that's faithful, do you hear what I'm saying? So if you want to be found faithful, you better have the right filter. You better filter your affections through God, his word, and his people, or you'll have no shot of being found faithful. The good news, though, is God, his word, and us, his people, are here to help you. Be that filter so that you can be found faithful. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much that you not only created us, but when we walked away, you came to us 
and you saved us. And now you will empower us to not only be a part of your family, but to be faithful. So God, we pray that we would allow you, your word, and your people, and the pattern of holiness that we want to be the filter by which we live so that we can be found faithful. But God, we know that there are people here today that don't know you. They're not in the family because they've never trusted Jesus. And they're hearing about how you want to help them, but they've never thought of it that way before. I pray today you'd save them. No one looking around or talking here as we close always. We believe God is alive and he's active and he's drawing people to himself. Jesus said, if you will lift me up, I will draw people to yourself. So if that's happening today, today is your chance to respond. And maybe you've never trusted Christ and God has now opened your eyes and now you can respond in faith and be saved. So if that's you, if you wanna pray and trust Christ, you can pray with me. You don't have to do it out loud, but it goes like this. Say, Father, thank you for loving me that you sent your son, Jesus, in my place for my sins. I ask you to save me, forgive me. I wanna be a part of your family. Now help me to be faithful. Again, nobody looking around or talking, but if you just prayed that with me, would you just simply lift your hand up so we can see that? We got men and women that are here gonna put a gift in your hand and when they do, you can put it down. Thank you. But then those of us who have trusted Jesus, listen, all of us, myself included, fail to be faithful at times. The painfulness of this pattern kicks us out, leads us astray. But the good news of God is if we're willing to confess and repent and take an honest look at our life and see if we have these ingredients, if we're actively pursuing the presence of God, if we're actively trying to align our life by the principles of God, we're actively pursuing relationships with the people of God. And we're actively trying to live out a pattern of practicing this truth. But I know if you're anything like me, there's probably one or more of those things that you're currently failing on. And again, the good news is there's grace. But maybe the Spirit is speaking to you today about one of those or more of those areas of your life saying, you need this. You need to ask me for help. You need to get in my word. You need to get with my people. Maybe this is your church. You wanna join this church. You wanna serve on a team, get in a group, be a part of the people so that you have a shot at actually practicing a pattern. I don't know what it is for you, but I'm praying that the Lord speaks to you. Father, thank you again I pray, God, that we would regard ourselves this same way like Paul did. We would regard ourselves as servants and as stewards, and we want to be found faithful. So God, help us to have the right filter. Help us to have this process in our life that's helping us process, that's helping us filter our affections, God, through you and your word and your people. Because if we don't have the right filter, God, we cannot be found faithful. So I pray that you would bring this about in our life. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.